When learning about history, it's not only important to note the events that have shaped the world into what it is today, but we should also remember the small occurrences that led up to those historical events. And sometimes the coincidences involved are almost too uncanny to believe. Number 10. In times of war, each side will do whatever it takes to gain an advantage over the other. And very often, this means getting a little creative, so that your tactics aren't immediately obvious as was the case of the outbreak of World War I in 1914. The RMS Carmania was one of the very first merchant cruiser ships to be converted to a battleship by the British Navy. Its purpose was to identify and immobilize German ships that were stationed near Trinidad, and to target British merchant ships. But the German side had a trick up its sleeve. In order to fool British ships, They'd converted one of their ocean liners, the Cap Trafalgar, into a warship and painted it the same colors as the Carmania. But they could not have expected the coincidence that occurred next. On the 14th of September of that year, at around noon, the RMS Carmania happened upon the Cap Trafalgar, flying a false flag, and the captain immediately knew that it belonged to German forces. At this point, the two vessels were about four miles apart, but since both were equipped with naval weapons, they started firing at each other. But as the battle raged on, the two ships got ever closer to each other, and realizing that it was faring much better at close range, the Cap Trafalgar's captain attempted to close the gap even further. But not to be outdone, the RMS Carmania's captain ordered his crew to keep firing while both ships took on damage, and it would only be a matter of time until one or the other would be victorious. For the next two years, the two ships remained engaged in a ferocious battle at sea, and the Carmania's bridge was completely destroyed. Soon, fire started breaking out on both ships, and their respective crews scrambled to keep them under control. As the ships drifted closer, at one point coming within a few hundred yards of each other, soldiers ran out onto the decks and started firing at the opposition with firearms, all while each of the two ships was still firing at the other. But by 2 p.m., it was clear who had been the victor. When all was said and done, the RMS Carmania took a total of 79 hits, which resulted in 304 holes being torn into its hull. While the Cap Trafalgar didn't take as many direct hits, a total of 73, they resulted in 380 holes that allowed water to flood the ship, and soon it started to list to one side. It was now certain that the vessel would go down, and the Cap Trafalgar's crew was ordered to abandon ship. The Carmania's crew watched as lifeboats were lowered down the side of the German ship, and 279 sailors were taken prisoner before it disappeared beneath the waves. Another German ship arrived in the area after hearing the Cap Trafalgar's SOS messages, but since many other warships would have heard the same thing and were likely racing to the area, its captain decided not to attack the British ship and instead fled to safety. Though the Carmania was also badly damaged and listing to one side, it managed to continue sailing until the next day, when other Royal Navy ships were able to accompany it to Brazil. The Carmania would eventually be repaired and would continue to serve as a passenger liner from 1923. It would eventually be scrapped in 1932 after it was sold to Hughes Bulkow and Company. Number 9. The Tyndale Bible is said to be the first English translation that took its text directly from Hebrew and Greek sources, though it also took some elements from the Latin Vulgate and Luther's German New Testament. These texts were created between 1522 and 1535, but in 1604, King James I ordered that a new English version be created, and that resulted in the authorized King James Version of the Bible that many of us are familiar with today. The finishing touches to this new version were underway in 1610, and it was finally completed in 1611. Today, it's still considered by many English-speaking people to be the definitive edition of the Bible, as it's used all over the world and is still currently being mass-produced. But there is one aspect of the King James Bible that's been a topic of debate for centuries, since many people believe that William Shakespeare had a hand in its creation though some think that the proof that's been presented is mere coincidence. What we know for certain is that Shakespeare would have still been alive when the King James Version was completed, since he passed away in 1616. In 1610, when this version was being finalized, he would have been 46 years old, and this is where things get a little bit strange. 
If you were to turn to the book of Psalms, specifically Psalm 46, you might find something very interesting. Counting from the first word of the psalm, you'll find that the 46th word is shake, as it talks about the shaking of mountains. But if you were to count backwards from the end of the psalm, you'd find that the 46th word is spear, as it talks about spears being cut asunder. Put those words together and you get Shakespeare. This has led many people to theorize that William Shakespeare was at least partially responsible for the King James Version's translation, though there's no solid documented proof that this is the case. While many people have suggested that this is a mere coincidence, others feel that it would be too unlikely and that the great bard must have inserted his name into this version on purpose, likely as proof that he had a hand in its creation. What is known is that no single individual is responsible for the translation. The Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, Richard Bancroft, was given the task of overseeing the translation. But as for the actual work, this was done by 47 scholars and members of clergy who were appointed by the king. This means that we can't say with certainty which of the scholars or clergymen wrote which passage, and furthermore, we can't say without a doubt whether Shakespeare was involved or not. Many naysayers believe that Shakespeare's writing style was too elaborate for it to have been used in a translation of the Bible. But there are many others who think that he would have adapted his style to fit with that of the other translators, since he was remarkably talented. It's also been suggested that he would have been most unwelcome among the scholars and the clergymen, who were hard at work on the project, since they would have had superior knowledge of the Bible and would have scoffed at the idea of a playwright becoming involved. It's a mystery that's still hotly debated today, and unless proof is found to either confirm or discount this theory, we're unlikely to find any definitive answers anytime soon. Number 8. There are certain days on the calendar that are celebrated or considered to be special in countries all over the world. For example, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, and Valentine's Day to name just a few. On the other hand, there are certain dates that are celebrated in one specific country. The US has the 4th of July, England has Bonfire Night, and Canada celebrates Victoria Day, which honors Queen Victoria. But there is one day that's celebrated in Germany that's different from all these remarkable dates, since it's always celebrated on the same day of the month, but denotes many different events that took place in the country throughout history. The date in question is the 9th of November, known as Schicksalstag, which translates to Day of Fate, and is considered to be somewhat of a coincidental holiday, since so many important events took place on that particular day. The first notable event took place in 1849, when Democratic politician Robert Blum lost his life, marking the end of the 1848 revolution. Many German people stood fast behind the revolution, since they believed it would ultimately unify the country thanks to a constitution that included civil rights. Up to that point, Germany consisted of several different states rather than one country, and the people in power over those states ruled with iron fists in many instances forbidding travel between these states. This had an adverse effect on the population since living conditions were poor and the economy was in shambles. But Blum aimed to change that. But when he lost his life, these hopes were dashed and the revolution was officially declared a failure. The next event took place on the same day in 1918, and it's quoted as being the day that the German Empire fell. World War I was coming to a rapid close as German forces were forced to retreat, and the German population had become increasingly disillusioned with their emperor, Wilhelm II. Realizing that his popularity was quickly dwindling, he fled to the Netherlands, triggering the collapse of the entire empire. The socialist and communist parties established a new government, and on the 9th of November, both Frederick Ebert, leader of the SPD, and Karl Liebknecht, co-leader of the Spartacus League, proclaimed that Germany should be a constitutional monarchy. But the Spartacus League's efforts were thwarted by the German army and the SPD, creating a great amount of animosity between the SPD and the KPD, which would eventually lead to the rise of the Nazi movement. The same date in 1923 is named Hitler Push, or Beer Hall Push. During this time, the German economy was struggling badly and its citizens were unable to earn a decent living wage. Many groups started revolts that usually never led anywhere, and eventually, the National Socialist German Workers' Party was established. On this date, their leader, Adolf Hitler, led the group on a march from Beer Hall, which is situated in Munich to Berlin, where they aimed to seize power. 
but they never made it that far as they were stopped by authorities. Hitler was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison, though he was out after serving just nine months. But during his stint behind bars, he wrote the well-known book Mein Kampf. The 9th of November, 1938, is known as the Night of Broken Glass, which marks another significant date on the calendar for the country, though its details are too graphic to describe here. On the same date in 1989, the Berlin Wall was finally brought down, marking the unification of East and West Germany after 28 years of separation. Ironically, the wall wasn't supposed to come down on that day. East German bureaucrat Gunter Schabowski mistakenly announced that more relaxed travel rights would take immediate effect, resulting in thousands of people storming the wall and leaving guards with no choice but to let them tear it down. Number 7. Beatles fans are all familiar with the popular song Eleanor Rigby, which was written by Paul McCartney. The lyrics tell the tale of a lonesome woman named Eleanor Rigby who passes away in a church without anyone by her side. At her funeral, a priest named Father Mackenzie, who's from the same church, delivers her service. But it isn't your usual funeral, as no one bothered to attend, underlining just how lonely the woman really was during her life. Many people have wondered whether Eleanor Rigby was a real person, and whether the story really took place. The short answer is that she didn't really exist, and that the narrative was completely made up, but it comes with a few strange coincidences. McCartney stated that he was sitting at his piano when he had the idea for the song. When thinking of a name for the woman in the song, he decided her first name should be Eleanor, named after Eleanor Braun, who had a role in the band's film, Help. Her last name was originally meant to be Bygraves, but it was later changed to Rigby when he happened upon a wine merchant in Bristol called Rigby and Events LTD, and he liked the sound of it. As for the priest, he was originally named McCartney since the three syllables in his surname fit nicely with the song's rhythm. But since Paul thought his father would find it a bit unnerving, it was changed to McKinsey after he found the name in a phone book. But long after the song became popular, some Beatles fans started to speculate that Eleanor was a real person, after they found a gravestone with the name near McCartney's childhood home in Woolton, Liverpool. It was common knowledge that he and John Lennon would often meet up in that cemetery and likely discussed their music on several occasions. When fans then discovered another headstone containing the last name McKenzie, they were convinced that the song was written about these two people. When asked about this, McCartney stated that he'd invented the characters and their names, but he admitted that he may have subliminally been influenced by the two graves that he would have seen all those years ago. He added that he drew inspiration for Eleanor's character from an elderly lady that he knew while growing up since she seemed very lonely. He used to do her shopping for her and visited her to listen to stories about World War II, but he felt sorry for her since she couldn't leave her house due to her age. While the song is based on the lives of real people that McCartney met during his childhood, the story portrayed by the lyrics is completely made up, and the fact that two people with the same names are buried in his hometown is a mere coincidence, as unlikely as that may seem. Number 6. Many married couples believe that meeting their partner was meant to be, and that they would have ended up together no matter what. But one marriage contains a coincidence that sends shivers down most people's spines since things could have turned out very differently. After a man named Stephen Lee asked his girlfriend Helen to marry him, the couple was overjoyed to share the news with their families, and Helen invited her parents to their place in New York to meet her fiancé. After making his acquaintance, her parents spent the afternoon visiting with the couple, and at one point, Stephen got his old photo albums to show some of his family members to his bride-to-be's family. Stephen's mother and stepfather were also present and the group spent some time recalling stories from their past. But when Helen's mother turned the page of the photo album and noticed one particular photo, she fell strangely silent. She pointed to a man in the photo and asked Stephen who the man was, to which he replied that it was his father who passed away many years prior when he was 17 years old. She then asked what the man's name was and upon hearing the answer, she nodded and continued browsing through the album. No one thought much of the incident, since Helen's mother didn't say anything else. But the truth of the matter is, she was so overcome with emotion upon seeing the man in the photo that she decided to keep quiet, and with good reason. She would later call Helen to explain why she was so curious about that particular photo. She would reveal that when Stephen's father was still in his 20s, he and Helen's mother happened to meet, and they fell hopelessly in love. 
After being together for some time, Stephen's father decided to propose, and Helen's mother gladly accepted. And they were happier than ever, knowing that they'd be getting married soon and spending the rest of their lives together. But in the end, it wasn't meant to be. Helen's grandfather was dead set against the marriage, since he decided that she should marry another man that he considered to be more suitable for reasons that have not been mentioned. Eventually, both Helen's mother's family and Stephen's father's family immigrated to the U.S. from Korea, and they were unable to keep in touch any longer. She never spoke of the incident, but when she saw the photo in Stephen's photo album, all those memories came flooding back, and she couldn't believe that she was looking at the man whom she was so desperately in love with decades ago. Helen was understandably surprised at the revelation and shared it with Stephen, who then spoke to his mother about it. She stated that she knew about a woman who his father had loved before they met, but added that they never really discussed it much. It was a chapter in his life that had passed many years ago, and they were focused on their lives together, but she never imagined that her son would one day marry that woman's daughter. Helen's father was convinced that his coincidence was a sure sign that their marriage was meant to be, and Stephen also saw it as a blessing, since he could talk to Helen's mother about his father, whom he only knew until his passing when he was a teenager. He stated that it made him feel as if his father was once again a part of his life. He and Helen eventually got married, raised their own family, and forged their own lives together, living out the dream that their parents once had. Number 5. Most of us can only dream about winning the lottery, since the chances of your numbers coming up during the draw are infinitely small. But as we all know, it does happen rather often, and we consider those people to be very lucky, since their lives are changed forever. Most people who play the lottery do so for years and decades without ever winning a substantial amount, which makes the story of a Texas woman named Joanne Ginther all the more unlikely, but no less true. Imagine beating odds of 18 septillion to 1. It's a calculation that most of us can't even visualize, no less calculate. But Joanne somehow managed to beat those odds as she won the Texas lottery a total of four times over a 10-year period. The first of her windfalls came in 1993, when she played the lottery and won $5.4 million. But this was just the beginning. Thirteen years later, in 2006, she played and won again, this time bagging a total of $2 million. With $7.4 million in her bank account, her life had been changed forever and she was virtually financially set for the rest of her life. But her good fortune would continue when she had another win just a few years later. In 2008, she won a further $3 million, and in 2010, she defied all odds when her numbers came up once again, resulting in the biggest payout yet, a prize of $10 million. It would later be revealed that she won most of the money after buying scratch lottery cards, all of which were purchased in the same store which is located in the city of Bishop in Texas. But her inexplicable luck soon drew the attention of the authorities, since they were certain she was cheating the system somehow. And these suspicions only grew when it came to light that Joanne had a PhD in statistics, which she earned at Stanford University. This has caused a lot of speculation that she managed to somehow find a system by which she could predict when a winning scratch card would be delivered to that particular store. She would then have to buy most of the tickets available to ensure that she had the winning one. But no one knows whether she ever bought more than one at a time. Writer Nathaniel Rich has a few theories as to how Joanne could have cheated the system though he does admit that there is a small chance she just got lucky and happened to buy the right ticket at the right time. He stated that Joanne could have used information that's freely available to the public to find a pattern in the computer algorithm that decides which tickets will go to which store and when they'll be delivered to that store. She would then bide her time and wait for a winning ticket to arrive at a store that's located in a small community, since this would lessen the chances of it being bought before she had a chance to. She would then have to find a reason to be in that area at that time, since it would look very suspicious if she were to travel to a remote location just to buy a winning lottery ticket on multiple occasions. He also speculated that she and the owner of the store may have had an arrangement, where they would keep the requested tickets aside until she could buy them, but there's no proof that this is the case. Despite all this speculation, Texas Lottery Commission officials have stated that they found no reason to suspect foul play in Joanne's massive winnings and that they consider it to be one huge coincidence, making her one of the luckiest people alive. Number 4. Couples often find very inventive ways of celebrating their wedding day, whether it's on the day that they got married or many years later while they're celebrating their wedding anniversary. 
Some couples decide to go on a holiday to an unlikely destination, while others decide to renew their wedding vows, further cementing their devotion to each other, while others throw elaborate parties, inviting their families and friends to join them in remembering their special day. When Matt Bears and Melody Kloska tied the knot on a Lake Michigan beach on the 18th of August, 2017, they also devised a unique way of commemorating the occasion. They placed a piece of paper containing their wedding vows into a bottle and released it into the lake, and they likely thought they'd never see it again. But as history has told us, the truth can be stranger than fiction, as is evidenced by the uncanny coincidences that followed. Just a few weeks after the wedding took place, husband and wife Fred and Lynette Dubendorf were enjoying a stroll along a beach near their home in Mears, Michigan, while walking their dogs and Lynette was scouring the beach for trash that she could clean up. She then came across a bottle that was sticking up out of the sand, and thinking that someone had carelessly left it behind, she picked it up, but immediately noticed something strange about it. She realized that it was some kind of a message in a bottle and excitedly opened it, curious to see what would be written on the note inside. She and Fred soon realized that it must have been a part of a wedding ceremony, since it contained both the groom and bride's names, addresses, and wedding vows, and at first she didn't want to respond since she thought it would promote littering on the beach. But when they realized that Bears and Kloska also got married on a Lake Michigan beach just as they did, and that they tied the knot on the same day 28 years after their wedding took place, they decided it was too much of a coincidence, and they needed to get in touch with the couple to share the inexplicable news. Lynette wrote to the newlywed couple and explained that they'd come across the bottle 80 miles from where it was released into the lake. She added that they found the note between Pentwater and Silver Lake and that they had their wedding ceremony at Pentwater. Upon reading the letter, Bears and Kloska were dumbstruck and had to read it a few more times before realizing just how huge of a coincidence it was. Kloska took it as a good omen that he and Bears were meant to get married and they chose the right day to do so. The revelation was made all the more special since both Bears and Kloska had been in failed marriages before and only met each other later on in their lives. They were both wary of getting married again after dating for five years, but are now convinced that they made the right decision. Number 3. Most of us wish that we could relive some of our childhood memories since they were more innocent times, and we were free from the daily responsibilities that we now face as adults but it's a very rare occasion indeed when that actually happens. But there is at least one documented case that took place in Paris in 1929 when an unlikely coincidence reunited Anne Parrish with an item from her childhood that she thought she would never see again. During that time, Anne and her husband, Charles Albert Corliss, were spending time next to the Seine River in La Ville Lumiere. They were interested in the bouquinist stalls that sold antique books and interesting postcards. In the past, these items would have been sold from wooden carts next to the river. But in 1859, stalls were set up at certain points next to the river, making these stalls a permanent fixture of the waterfront. Since Anne had published many children's books and other novels, she had a great interest in old books, and so was fascinated by the different authors and stories that she found while leisurely browsing the stalls. It should be noted that there were around 900 of these stalls, and so she couldn't possibly have visited them all. But while looking through the books at one particular stall, she saw one that she remembered from her childhood. The book in question was entitled Jack Frost and Other Stories, and this particular copy was in rough shape, showing that it was clearly loved by its previous owner, since they must have read it many times while they owned it. However, the condition was good enough that the tale could still be read and enjoyed, and since it brought back good memories from when she was a child, and since she never happened upon another copy, she decided to buy it for one franc. When she showed the book to her husband, he was less than impressed since he thought it didn't hold much literary value, but she explained that she bought it as a frivolous gift to herself, as a reminder of when she was a child. As a game, he scoffed and asked her to recount a single part of the book, and she responded by telling him one of the stories in which a girl named Dorothy had a serious dislike of her own nose. He then flipped through the book's pages and eventually found the story in question, admitting defeat. He then continued thumbing through the pages, but as he got to the inner front page, he suddenly stopped and looked at Anne with an odd expression of surprise on his face. He simply turned the book towards Anne and pointed to a writing in a child's hand on the inside cover. To his surprise and Anne's, it read, Anne Parrish, 209 North Weber Street, Colorado Springs. 
In a most unlikely coincidence, the book had somehow made its way from Colorado Springs all the way to Paris, and quite unbelievably, back into the hands of the person who originally owned it decades earlier. The fact that it was present on the day that Anne and Charles were walking along the river is already an unlikely event. But the coincidence of her finding it among all those stalls and deciding at the last minute to buy it is even more unlikely. It almost seems as though she was fated to have it so that she could recall the happy memories of her childhood. Number 2. 80-year-old Zhu Weifeng is a resident of China's Jiangsu province. His house is situated next to a river, and through the years that he's lived there, he saved a total of five people from drowning. Given his age, one would imagine that it would be hard for him to repeat such an amazing feat. He'd also suffered a bad fall down a set of stairs, and he was dealing with a few of his injuries in 2018, when a very unlikely event took place. In August of that year, a young boy was playing next to the river while in the care of his grandmother when he slipped and ended up in the water. In no time, he realized he was in trouble as he was struggling to stay afloat, and so he started frantically calling for help. Luckily for the boy, Wei Feng was home at the time and he and his wife both heard the boy splashing in the water and his yells, and he immediately knew he had to do something to help, despite not being in the best physical shape. He and his wife raced to the water, and with her help, he was lowered down into the river where he managed to grab a hold of the boy and pull him to safety, much to the gratitude of his grandmother. He was then taken to a nearby hospital where he received treatment and would go on to make a full recovery. But the strange tale doesn't end there. Wei Feng and his wife were curious to see how the boy was recovering, and so they decided to pay him a visit while he was still in the hospital. And while there, they started talking to many people that he pulled out of the river over the years. This was when they made a startling discovery. As Wei Feng recounted the different incidents, he mentioned the first person that he ever saved from drowning, and it soon dawned on the boy that he was talking about his own father. He added that at that time, he was much younger and could quickly jump into the water to save the boy's father, unlike the latest incident where he needed his wife's help to get into the river before the rescue could be made. As soon as the news of the strange coincidence came out, the story went viral and Wei Feng is now being hailed as a selfless hero who put his own safety aside to save the lives of five people who would likely have perished had he not decided to intervene. Many of those people who've heard about the story say that it's unlikely that someone could save five people from drowning in the same river, but it's almost impossible to think that that same person would save a father and son from the same river in two incidents that took place 30 years apart. Strangely, it would come to light that Wei Feng knew the boy's grandmother 30 years ago, and he too found it unbelievable that he would end up saving the lives of both her son and grandson while they were drowning in the same stretch of river after decades had passed. Since the section of river where both the boy and his father were rescued is only about five and a half feet deep, it's believed that neither he nor his father knew how to swim, and hence they would very likely have drowned if it wasn't for Wei Feng's selflessness. Number 1. Many conspiracy websites and online forums would have you believe that the Earth's end is imminent and that it's likely to come thanks to a massive meteor strike that'll wipe out all life and likely take the entire planet with it. But the reality is that space is being constantly monitored, and if a meteor large enough to cause such an event is ever spotted, we'll know about it well in advance, and it could possibly be dealt with before such a catastrophic event could take place. The chances of someone being hit directly by a falling meteorite is estimated to be about 1 in 840 million, since only about 5% of meteorites are able to survive long enough to impact the Earth, and even then they're very small and unlikely to do any damage. The chances of your house being hit by one of these rocks is admittedly higher, about 1 in 33 million, but it's also very unlikely. If it does happen, you may not even notice, since the sound of it falling on your roof will probably be put down to something else like a falling branch or something even less significant. Imagine then what the odds would be of the same house being hit by two meteorites on separate occasions. It seems almost too uncanny to even consider, but one man who hails from northern Bosnia seems to have had unbelievably bad luck as his house has been struck not once or twice, but a total of six times, and he for one is desperate for an explanation. 50-year-old Radovok Latish is at his wit's end as he struggles to come to terms with the fact that his house seems to be a magnet for meteorites, 
that make it through the Earth's atmosphere, and he believes that there may be more to it than meets the eye. While being questioned about the unlikely events, he stated that whenever one of the meteorites struck his house, it was raining, and at first he thought they were just normal rocks. But he has since taken the rocks to Belgrade University, where they were closely studied by experts, who then confirmed that they are indeed meteorites that have traveled millions of miles, only to fall on the man's roof. But given how unlikely it is that his house is always being struck, he thinks there's something more sinister going on. He since stated that he believes his house is being targeted by extraterrestrial beings who hold a grudge against him for some unknown reason. In an interview, he stated that he believes they're toying with him by playing mind games, and he's since resorted to reinforcing the house's roof with steel, since he's concerned that one of the meteorites might just make it all the way into his house one day. Ironically, he managed to acquire the funds for the steel girders by selling one of the meteorites to a Dutch university. But he did, however, add that the situation isn't all doom and gloom, since people from all over the world have visited his house after hearing about the phenomenon and he has the opportunity to meet them. He also plans to put the meteorites on display in a small museum that he plans to open in his backyard, allowing him to meet even more new people. Since the amount of strikes on his house is anomalous, scientists have started studying the property to see whether it contains some sort of magnetic field that attracts the rocks, but the results of these studies are yet to be known. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.